Gaining knowledge is the first step to wisdom. Sharing it is the first step to humanity. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is with utmost pleasure and gratitude that I let you all know that I would be your host for the International Expert Lecture Series 2 on using mathematics to create symmetry patterns helmed by the Department of Mathematics and IQSE, Christnagar College, in association with Research Department of Mathematics, Sanadana Dharma College, Alapura. Today, we have with us Dr. Joseph A. Gallian, one of the greatest names in the field of abstract algebra to grace the event. Without further ado, I humbly invite Mr. Anand M.G., Assistant Professor, Department of Mathematics, Kreisnagar College, for the welcome speech. Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to all of you to International Expert Lecture Series, Part 2, organized by the Department of Mathematics and the IQASI of Krishnagar College, Trivandrum, in association with Sanadana Dharma College, Alabra. Today is one of the best days of, for the Department of Mathematics of Krishnagar College. It is all because of our chief guest, Dr. Joseph A. Gallian, Professor, Department of Mathematics and Statistics, University of Minnesota, Duluth, USA. Our chief guest does not require an introduction as he is well recognized figure among the mathematics aspirants across the globe. He has authored or edited six books. One of them is our reference for abstract algebra course for undergraduate and postgraduate programs. He is known for REU program combinatorics as well. A part of this, he served as two term as the president of the Mathematical Association of America. Besides, he was the co-director of Project Next, the associated editor of MAA Online, a member of advisory board of Math Horizons, a member of editorial board of the Mathematics Magazine and the American Mathematical Monthly. He received Mary P. Dolkiani Award from the Mathematical Association of America. HIMO Award from the Mathematical Association of America. The Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching Minnesota Professor of the Year, Mathematical Association of America, and Gangan Hu Award for Distinguished Service to Mathematics. On behalf of Krishnagar College, I welcome our chief guest, Dr. Joseph A. Galian. Professor, it's an honor, honorable moment for our institution to have you have your prestigious presence in today's event. I would like to welcome our principal, Dr. Jolie Jacob, whose excellence guidance has supported and helped us to organize such an event. I'm happy to welcome you, ma'am. Now I welcome manager and director of Christnagar College, Reverend Father Dr. Tito Vargas CMI for giving permission and motivation to organize this program. I'm extremely happy to welcome you, Father. Next, I welcome the head of the Department of Mathematics of Krishnagar College, Dr. Mary Matilda Rosby, and the head of the Department of Mathematics of Sanadana Dharma College, Professor R. Srikumar, for their wholehearted support and guidance. I welcome all the academicians, research scholars, and students from across the globe who are here to take part in today's session. Warm welcome all the HODs of our college and my colleagues. Once again, on behalf of Krishnagar family, I welcome you and wish you wish you uh, you would enjoy this thought pro uh, thought provoking session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anand M. G. I now humbly hand over the session to our resource speaker, Dr. Joseph A. Gallian, Professor, Department of Mathematics and Statistics, University of Minnesota, Duluth, United States of America. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm very excited to give this talk and give talks for 50 years. And this is the first time I've ever given a talk to an audience other than the United States and Canada. So uh, I'm looking forward to this. Okay, what I'd like to talk about is um, how do I, let's see. Okay, using mathematics to create a pattern. How do I get this? There's a little screen here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, there it is. All right. Um, what's happening? <laughs> All right. In any case, um, the purpose of this talk is twofold. 
this is how Matt goes. You start with a very, very simple question and then answer that one and say, well, that leads to another question, then another question, another question, another question. And uh, I'm going to illustrate today. And another thing I'd like to illustrate is that under the right conditions, with the right supervision and the right students, I can do original research that's published in leading journals. Um, okay, so let's get started. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm at exposure. Start with a very, very simple question and then answer that one and say, well, that leads to another question, then another question, another question, another question. And uh, I'm going to illustrate today. And another thing I'd like to illustrate is that under the right conditions, with the right supervision and the right students, I can do original research that's published in leading journals. Um, okay, so let's get started. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm at exposure. Start with a very, very simple question and then answer that one and say, well, that leads to another question, then another question, another question, another question. And uh, um, I'm going to Today. Something dramatically and wrong here. Like is that my the right recording. With the right supervision and the right students, I can do original research. Oh, can the moderator help me here? Um, can you hear me? All right, well. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Uh, okay, let's see here. So anyway, uh, I'd like to say that all the results I'm going to show you came from a uh, research program I started in both in 1977. And in fact, most of you, probably all of you know the most famous participant that I ever had in the program. Uh, Okay, um, there's Mon Barca, Professor at Princeton. He's won the Fields Medal in 2014, and I was there in Seoul, South Korea. I was one of the three honored guests outside of my family to be at the ceremony. And this is the next day, the day after he won the uh, Fields Medal. And we tour, we had family, friends, and breakfast in there. There's the t-shirts we wore. Okay, the seeds were for this problem, this idea I'm going to discuss, we're playing a way back in 1978. And here's the idea. Um, Carter and Erdish in the Journal of Graph Theory posed this very simple problem. Um, suppose you start this is a three by five rectangle graph and it's vertex symmetric. All, there's no one vertex that's any different than the other. There's no corner here because these are just going right, it gets right around. So these are totally indistinguishable. This is really should be drawn on a torus, and then you would see that there's no, no vertex different in the air. So the question is, you start any vertex you want, I'll, for convenience, I'll start up here. And then you're allowed to follow these arrows, and you want to visit each vertex exactly once, and return to the starting position. So like, for example, I could, I could start here. I could go uh, there, 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 there. And can you visit these vertex exactly once and return to the starting position? If you can, it's called a Hamiltonian circuit. Okay. And there's Tom Rutter on the left, Torch on the right. And of course, they asked a general question uh, when does there exist a Hamiltonian circuit? And my end direct grid on it first. Um, this is the way you should draw it, but it's too complicated. It's, you know, this shows the vertex symmetry of the graph. But I'll just draw them at kind of array because it's easier to, easier to draw. So anyway, there's some very easy cases. For example, let's look at three, three I'll start here. And the algorithm I'll always move to the right whenever possible. Uh, I'll always move horizontally, I should say, whenever possible, because there's no right on it. But in case start here. So I'll move vertically, move vertically. Now I'm forced to move horizontally because if I'm if my third move were vertically, I'd be back to the starting place. So I have to crawl vertically and then reach to the starting point. So so when I move horizontally, horizontally, now I'm forced to move vertically. Now remember the outcomes where you can move horizontally. And now I move horizontally, horizontally. Now I'm forced to move vertically again because if I made a third, a, another horizontal, I visit that vertex 
things. Okay, so first the vertical there, and then horizontal, horizontal, and now I can return to the starting position. Okay, well, so you can see this works on N and grid. Here's five by five. So I covered the whole first row and exit here, then I covered it with, with horizontal moves, and then I horizontal moves the whole second row because it's already covered, and you can see what happens. You're always exiting down this diagonal, and since it's a square, you'll finish the last row and right in position back Top. By the way, I'm not allowed to go from here to here. That's not, you, you know, you're not allowed to move backwards. You always have to go down unless you're moving around. Okay, now the, the square that actually works for when one parameter divides the other one. Um, because I suppose I have um, KN by N grid, I can K box N by N. So I'd cover the first block like this, but instead of going back to the beginning, we don't want to do that. We want to go to the second. Block. I can the second block that I showed before and move to the third block. That always works when you have one parameter and divides the other. Now, uh, you can't always do this. Like on three by five, that showed you, you cannot find a circuit. And one reason why is there's multiple reasons, but one reason is a necessary condition the great common divisor of the third row and the number columns has to be in one. And this is easy to see. Let me show you on an example. So, what I want you to do is notice I have five rows. Seven columns. Now, let's count vertical moves. Here, it's one vertical move, um, two vertical moves, three vertical moves, four vertical moves, five vertical moves. If you have five rows, you can see what happens. If you start in the top row, after five vertical moves, you'll be back to the top row. After another five, you'll be back to the top row. After another five, you'll be back to the top row. Remember, you have the fish in the top row. In fact, the top row in the, in the left hand corner. So that proves this argument shows. That if you have a Hamiltonian circuit, M and N, well, in this case, five by seven, the same argument works as M and N are relatively prime. Um, then it ha the number of vertical moves to be a multiple of five, but the same argument shows the number of horizontal moves has to be a multiple of seven. And so here's what we have every, ver every circuit is a combination of a number of vertical moves and a certain number of horizontal moves, and they have to tally up to the total number of moves. Now, here's where I get a contradiction. I'm proving that five, seven can't have money in script, but the argument works perfectly fine if I replace five by M and seven by N, as long as M and N are out prime. Here we have a contradiction because five divides this number, five divides that number, so therefore five would divide seven times B. But five doesn't divide seven, so then it has to divide B. But you have 35, 35 horizontal moves. Um, but then 35 horizontal moves, it just means you're wrapping around the throw again and again and again. You're not seeing it all. Okay, so um, so that that shows you how how we get this uh, necessary condition GC is B1. Well, this out product here they had a proof and they had a complete characterization of when you can solve this problem on an M by N directed grid. But the but the argument was the uh, proof, in other words. If you if I gave somebody a, a pair of numbers, a row number and column number, it would be complicated to use trotarity theorem. It wasn't easy to use. So I asked one of my undergraduate students that was with me for the summer. I said to him, uh, is a nice idea. The idea was nice, but but their proof, the, the result is hard to use. Their condition, necessary and sufficient condition. I asked if he came up with a better way, and he called it. They use pure group theoretic techniques in their argument, Trotter and Erdős. But what Curran did was he used what's called not theory, not theory argument. And so here's the theorem. So it is used. You don't have to even draw any pictures. You can tell if there's a circuit, yes or no. So um, we have an A by N grid, and then A is going to be the number of times you wrap around vertically, and B is going to be the number of times you're wrapping around horizontally, and everything's one or the other. That's how many vertices you're going to put all together. So, Okay, that's necessary, obviously. But then here's the interesting thing: the wraparound numbers. Like if you went, if you went vertically five times and horizontally fifteen times, something. Well, let's say seven times. Uh, the GCD of the wrapping numbers, the times you wrap around, has to be equal to one. Um, that's necessary and efficient. Let's look at four by six. Four by six, you try to get a linear combination of four and six is equal to twenty-four, and then you check to see that the GCD of the three and the two, the wrapping numbers, is equal to one. Indeed, it is. Now, the, the current theorem doesn't tell you how to draw the picture. 
It doesn't tell you, it's just, it's just this is to fit. But it gives you some clues. For example, I can see from this equation that I'm going to have, if I am going to have 12 vertical moves and 12 horizontal moves. So if I was going to try to draw the picture, the easiest way to have an equal number of horizontal vertical moves is just alternate. By the way, this is Steve in the red shirt here. It's like there. And that's me 50 years ago. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so let's try this. Uh, go alternate. Uh, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical, and then D um, and, and it's the three. we wrap around. So remember this three. What does that mean? Okay, I wrapped around three times horizontally. That was the that was the first the first wrap around there, second wrap around there, and third wrap around there, and I wrapped two times around um, horizontally. Okay, let's look at eight by twelve. You have to do three pairs. You say, well, 12 equal to 96. And you have to check that the GCD of these coefficients, 92, has to be equal to 1. And there. Now, a nice thing about this is, well, I shouldn't say a nice thing. An interesting thing about this is if there is a circuit, there might not be a circuit, but if it is, it's never unique. There's all, if you have one, then you have more than one. Uh, I bring this up because I'm going to refer to it in a few minutes. Okay, uh, let me just mention, uh, I, I can't have time to give a lot of techniques or arguments, but I can show you one important thing um, where the theory is involved. Take the one element, that the one I use one comma minus one, but of course you could call it one and n minus one because in law and arithmetic. And can that subgroup. So that's the, the order of that subgroup is the least common multiple of m times n. And that's called the arc forcing subgroup. I'll show you that means in a few minutes. But here are the key stuff. This is what makes things easy. Suppose this one vertex, pick any vertex you like. So if that vertex moves vertically, then every element of the vertex in the code that moves vertically. So all you have to do is make a choice for one vertex, and then that automatically determines all the other moves. Of course, the same thing works for horizontal moves. So that's, that's one thing that allows you to find these circuits easily or more easily. OK, so that was completely solved. Current of that as a beautiful solution. And the thing that I do is remember, I alluded earlier, you have a simple question, and then you ask yourself, well, I'm doing another question. So here's something that led me to another question. Let's go back to the three by five. The GCD of three by five is equal to one. So there, we knew you can't hit 15 points in the three by five grid. Well, if I can't hit 15 points, I might ask, well, what's the best, next best thing I can do? Well, how about if you could visit 14 points? You can hit 15, but maybe you can 14. And if you can do such a thing, we call that a hypo Hamiltonian circuit. And that's a great name because hypo means below. Like if you suffer from hypothermia, your body temperature is below the normal. If you have a hypodermic needle in your arm, it sticks in a hypodermic needle. Derma means skin, and hypo means below. So the needle goes below your skin. So anyway, that's a question. When can you do this? Okay, first of all, I like to contrast this with the Hamiltonian case. For the Hamiltonian case, if, remember, you're trying to hit all vertices, m times n. And here, the necessary can what's easy to the writing number, the row number and column number is greater than one. But if you want to miss a vertex, delete a vertex, then it's, um, it's probably the necessary addition to GCD must be equal to one. Okay, now the proof is trivial. Let's look at it. Remember, this is you have m row and n columns. It's going to be more vertical moves and number of horizontal moves. And this is the total number of moves, m times n grid, but I missed one vertex. And so look, close you've got a common divider of m and say three is common divisor. Then three would divide this term, three would divide this term, three would divide that term, and therefore three would have to divide minus one, which is a prediction. So the necessary, the necessary to have the GCD equal to one. And here's another contrast. Remember when you had a Hamiltonian circuit, the circuit was unique. But if you have a Hamiltonian circuit, sorry, when you have a Hamiltonian circuit, it's never unique. On the other hand, when you have a hypo Hamiltonian circuit, it's always unique. And it's, I give you an inkling why, and I can tell you why. Let me show you here. So I'm claiming that if you have a Hamiltonian circuit on three by 
by five grid, then this has to be the circuit. That, that you have no choice. Every arc is forced. That's why I call that subgrid arc force sub. And let me explain why. See, let's let's look here. By the way, uh, okay. Um, let's start here. You sooner or later have to push this point. So when I come here, where can I go from here? Well, the original graph said you could go vertically or you could wrap around like that, but that point's missing. The far left corner is missing. You can't do that. Now I'm forced to do this. I'm forced to go down. As soon as you make this vertical move, you have to make this vertical move. And the reason why is, okay, I made this vertical move for you can go from here. You can go this way or that way. But if I went horizontally, then that means I'd visit this one twice. I already visited this once here, and I can't visit it a second time. So moving up. This is forced to vertical. Professor? As soon as you make this move, you have to make that Professor? move. Professor? Yes. Uh, Professor, there is a significant audio breakage here. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, Professor, there is an audio breakage. I think you are having a network issue. I don't know what, I don't know how to fix it. Oh, okay. Okay, Professor, I think uh, the participants are mentioning about the audio breakage here. It's what okay, you do. Uh, okay, Professor, you can continue. No problem. No continue? Worries. Ah, yes, Professor. Okay. okay. Every, every time there's a voltage, you know, in me and I'll pause and it'll fix itself. So, should continue? Yes, Professor, you can. But uh, okay. there, is, there is breakage. Uh, sometimes but it's okay you can continue okay anyway um so what's happening is this 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 vertical move is forced because we had placed over here but the vertical move to vertical move. and what we're doing is we're coming down this diagonal so vertical here means vertical here that means vertical here of course vertical here means up because where the around vertical really means come around the back of the torus all right now keep keep this arrow going so remember, I'm wrapping around the torus. This comes down, comes down. So, so to next, since I'm wrapping around, this next point is really up here. So that's also vertical. Keep coming down this diagonal and it comes to this vertical. This is vertical coming here. Now that wrap around. So that's vertical. So all those green arrows were forced because they had one missing vertex up here. The same argument works for the red. Every red arrow is forced um, for the same reason. For example, uh, why is this red arrow forced? Well, you could go here or narrow, you go up here, but that's a main point. So this has to go horizontal. Now we're going to go up this diagonal. So if that's horizontal, then this is horizontal, then this is horizontal, then I go around, that's horizontal, then I go that's horizontal, then I go around, then that point's missing. Okay, so now this is the only possible circuit. And when you look, you look at the circuit, it's just from that So it's 14 points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, thirteen, fourteen. Now wrap around this way. Okay, that's the fifteenth point. Oh, well, fourteen is like a con or something. There's only fourteen points in it. Okay, um, now let's look at a three by seven. Now remember, this is a necessary condition, and the same argument holds all these. All these vertical, all the green arrows are forced to go vertically because of the missing vertex, and all the red arrows are forced to go horizontally because of the missing vertex. Okay, so you can see either works or it doesn't. Um, so let's actually start somewhere and count. I'll start here. Now we're the twenty vertices in terms of being. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So. I did is if I put it in the right hand corner and I followed the forced arrows, instead of hitting 20, visiting 20 vertices, I've been rid of 10. So, um, so anyway, let's just for fun, let's pull those 10 vertices out, pull those vertices out of this in all row. And you have 10 vertices left, you have 10 arrows left. Well, it turns out that those remaining, the remaining vertices and arrows will force, will be another circuit of length instead of getting. One circuit of length 20 got two disjoint circuits of length 10 each, not Hamiltonian circuits, circuits of length 10, and disjoint means they have no come. Okay, so anyway, uh, here's a, this is a review. Am I, are you still, can you still hear me all right? I'll continue. Uh, 
on this quick review, a three by five was not Hamiltonian, but it was hypo because we checked the arrows. A three by seven is not Hamiltonian, that's not hypo. Oh, okay, this raises a good question. Remember that necessary condition of GCD greater than one, or sorry, equal to one? Three by five is GCD equal to one, three by seven is equal to one. That necessary condition is not sufficient. All right, well, then that raises a new question. Well, let's look at the three by seven. No, we can hit 21 because the GCD is wrong. We can't hit 20 because we forced all 20 arrows, and we got two circuits of like 10 each instead of a circuit of like 20. So you might say, well, next thing, if you can hit 21 and you can't hit 20, I'd say, well, maybe the circuit of like 19, maybe that's the best thing. That, that's not the way you should think about this. It's, you shouldn't think of it like this. Um, that's the wrong question. Here's a better question. Instead of I just do MN, I don't even know the MN. Air Trotter and Airdy says, when can you hit M times N? And then I change it and say, well, when can you hit M times M minus one? What I really should have said was, what's the longest circuit? So for example, um, for a four by six, we know it's 24. For a three by five, we know it's 14. For three by seven, we know it's not 20. The longest is not 20 and it's not nine. Uh, it's not 21 or 20, but it might be 19. So that, that's a better question. Should ask. And then even this is not the best question. That's the wrong question, I should say. Here's the right question. N M and N. Tell me uh, the length of every possible circuit, the longest circuit, the shortest circuit, and everything in between. That's the right question. And so find links to every circuit. Turns out the tendency the more students in my summer program, they use Nuren's uh, Curran's not theory technique. And the beauty answer. Now remember, let's go back to the Hamiltonian case. In the Hamiltonian case, specify how many points you want to hit. Say you want to hit R points. Well, an error specified in time n, and that's the condition of current value. This is the current result. All right. Now suppose I want to hit all but one, then I've replaced this by m times n minus one. And then I have to use the GCD of the wrapping number for three and five work but the GCD of the wrapping number from three by seven didn't work. So this completely solves every possible circuit, every possible grid, and, and, and such a clean result. Um, yeah, they use currents not by there's David Reed and seven five right there, and, and there's Steve Kern right there, and here's Larry Penn right down there, and that's me again. This is my OR program when you think was 1981. Um, this is my, RE program a little bit earlier. Uh, when I say RE, it means research for, for undergraduates. It's, it's a creation for you know, summer program. Okay, now I'm going to show you this referee's report. This is a journal of graph theory. And it says, the, um, see, Kennedy Center is a journal of graph theory, which is a leading journal in, in the journal in graph theory. Uh, okay, the enclosed, this is a referee's report. Color paper titled in the Cartesian directed cycles is hypo Hamiltonian. They really did the general case, um, but we just called it Hamiltonian because it was simple. It's a lovely piece of work. The result is interesting. The writing style is good. The paper is short to the point and easy to read. Contrast this with Trider and Erdish, leading mathematicians, uh, period of days, teacher, gravity. And this paper wins hands down. So here you have two undergraduates showing up, two professionals. Well, everybody knows Erdish, but for example, Tom Trier was of AT, American Telephone and Telegraph Research Division for many years. He was also chairman at Arizona University. So I think it's under, it's, and show them up it's pretty interesting. Uh, by the way, in all my career, I've never had a referee for my paper. I've never had a referee as good as this one. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Let's actually look at a three by seven. Now, we already knew in advance that we couldn't hit 21 points because the GCD is wrong. We hit 20 points because I did that forcing, arc forcing, and we got it the longest cycle was 10. Okay, um, or well, yeah, okay. I said the longest cycle was 10. When I tried to follow the arcs, 20 arcs, I got two circuits of like 10. Okay, but anyway, here's every possible circuit. Of course, this this means the down first column, down the first row. Well, this is across the top row, down the right hand side, across the bottom row, and up the left hand side. You just make a, a ring around the perimeter. And here's all the new combinations you make um, using the condition that the GCD had to be equal to one. Um, okay, so there it is. 
So you notice by is right in the nomination, but the DC for the ranking number is two. That's why, that's why you had that problem. See, this two means we're going to get two circuits. Okay, so there's the long circuit. Name. But we have to there's already forced, by the way. We we can just force the arrows to check it out. Okay, let's actually take a look at a circuit of length 13. Um, there it is. There's a circuit of length 19. Okay, now that problem is completely solved. Um, now we can find the length of every possible circuit and every possible grid. So what else can you do? Remember, I'm always thinking, what else can we do? What else can we do? Let's go back to the three by five. I remember um, three by five, we couldn't hit we couldn't hit all 15 points because the GC, GCD is wrong. But maybe I could do this. If I can't hit all, we'll still meet one point, but duplicate some other point. We'll, so we'll still visit M times N. We'll still visit it, the, 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 the time M points. One vertex will be missed and one vertex will be duplicated. Well, first of all, we need a name for that. Let's see. Yeah, okay. Uh, amen. Ah. Got ahead of myself. Let's start. I, I jumped ahead of myself. Start over again. Um, I, I think I did about missing a point and duplicating a point. That's coming up soon. Let's go back to this one. Um, so let's go back. Let's go back to the three by five. The three by seven. Now, I know we can hit uh, M by N. We can't hit 15 points or 21 points. Maybe if I allowed you to duplicate one vertex. Maybe if I allowed you to duplicate one, or visit one vertex twice, um, maybe then you can do it. So we need to name that. Uh, I call that a hyper Hamilton circuit because hyper means over. So you now we're, we're going over, we're hitting one point twice. That's over more than we want. And the way uh, it's trivial to see um, that the GCD is one, it's the same argument as before. Suppose this G GCD were a factor of three and three divide this term, three divide that, term, three divide that term, and three divide plus one this time. So that's, that's, and another thing, all the arcs are four. It's the same argument we have. Uh, okay, it's an example of three by five grid. Now remember, I can't hit 15, but I'm allowing you to duplicate one. The graph is vertex symmetric by, so no matter which one you pick, I this is a duplicate point. But all the arcs are four, it's exactly as before. Because look, if this point's duplicated, that means I have to, everywhere else, X, X, this one's X, this one's X, this one, this X twice, because I visited twice. So as soon as I make this move, it precludes this move. And as soon as I make this move, it precludes that move. So I'm gonna have the same diagonal argument and the same diagonal argument that way. Every arc is four. So this your work for it. If you check it out, let's check it out. Let's start here. So I should hit visit 15 vertices. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And <laughs> well, I, I kind of just want to look at it. Um, yeah, actually, one. Okay. So the point is, I came into this twice. I came in at once here and came in at there. I visited it twice, but I, that should be one. So anyway, um, that's where it works. Um, so here we have, by examination, we have a three by five is hyper Hamiltonian. What about a five by seven? It turns out the answer is no. So again, the GDD equal to one is necessary, but not sufficient. There, there's something the way three and five interact, different than the way three and seven interact. Because in one case, I get a hyper Hamiltonian circuit, in the other case, I didn't. But the question is, what's the solution? What's the characterization? Uh -huh. And this is one that I did with Woody. And, and it's incredibly easy. Look, it's perfect. Um, if you want to hit, it's perfect in the sense that it's as simple as it can be. Suppose you have M by N grid, and I want to visit um, some vertex twice. All right. And, and then this would be the number of vertical moves. That's the number of horizontal moves. Well, that's the, that's how many moves there were. And visiting one twice, that's where the plus one is. But now the GCD can be one or two. See that? Oh, extra freedom that allowing you to pass one tech second time gives me a second possibility for the GCD. Remember, if I want to hit exactly M times N, the GCD had one extra freedom allows me possibility. Okay, um, so let's look at a five by seven. Uh, all right, so um, five by seven must satisfy this condition. You have to find a number of vertical moves plus a horizontal moves has to be 35 plus one because we're going to visit one twice. 
And so I'm going to check every possibility. Just like a dog, just like all possibilities for bees. If you try all possibilities for bees, you're trying all possibilities. So I'm trying to get linear combinations equal to 36. There's no combination with one here because there's 36 vertices you're using. You don't want to use up seven there. And so that means there would have to be, what, 29 verticals, but 29 in the visible spot. Here, we had 15 horizontals, that would give you 22 verticals, but 22 is not divisible by five. Ah, look at this. That's exactly right. Well, not right. Um, we have the right number of this condition is satisfied, but the GCD is wrong. See, the GCD had the combination of 36 and the GCD. So here we tried every possibility, and therefore, um, there's no there's no hyper Hamiltonian circuit in five seven. Okay, uh, look at a three by five. On a three by five, remember, I can't hit 15 points with a circuit, but I have a set of length 16 to do reading while well, notice GCD is right. Okay, um, now, <laughs> I, I'm not going to go into detail, but suppose somebody might say, well, a 35, a five by seven grid, we can't hit 35 points. If I allow you to duplicate one, you can't, it doesn't work either. Turns out if you how you do two, that will work. All right. So that raises a new question. Um, suppose I allow you to duplicate R points. So if I pick R equal to zero in the Hamiltonian case, I pick R equal to one. I'm in the um uh, let's see. If I pick R equal to n times n in the Hamiltonian case, if I pick n times m minus one, then uh, sorry, yeah, m times m if I <laughs> Let's start over again. I pick R equal to zero. This is the number of duplicate points. Then that's Hamiltonian. If I pick R equal to one, that's hyper Hamiltonian. All right. Anyway, um, and here's the thing. Mr. Doug Rice is another one of my students. Oh. Um, yeah. Okay, Doug Rice. And this is how nice it is. In other words, um, that's the number of horizontal modes, vertical modes. That's the number of horizontal modes. That's the number of Able to get that number of duplications, you can take R equal to Hamilton, take R equal to one, you get hypo. And this time, because I'm allowing this extra freedom, the GCD is the extra. So you have R plus one choices for the GCD because I have these extra vertices. And, and if you look at it, remember we mentioned, I mentioned the five by seven, I says, well, maybe you could, if you, maybe you could. If I allow you to duplicate two points, you could visit every point exactly once, except for two, and those two would be okay. And indeed, that's the case because GCD is right. Okay, now there's Doug Youngrice on the top of that pyramid. Uh, there's me right there. There's David Woody right there. All right. Um, <laughs> here's another variation. Huh? Yeah, this is one I jumped ahead of myself. Go back to the three by five. We know we can get 15, but maybe I delete one vertex. But duplicate another one. So you could call it a hyper Hamiltonian because of the duplication, but it's a vertex delete graph. Hyper Hamiltonian means you delete point, but, but this would be a hyper Hamiltonian of a vertex deleted graph. And indeed, here's a result for this. this is my energy again. And, um, and remember, it's exactly m times n because we're missing one vertex, but we're duplicating one vertex. So we lose a point between the point. Here's the GED condition. Okay, so four by six, this, I'm not gonna go through the point, but notice I delete this point, I'm missing this point, but I'm duplicating the point, and D work. The circuit point four. well, uh, yes, a circuit, but it's not a hypo and not a Hamiltonian circuit. Okay, now, next central question, I asked the two students, uh, actually, I asked this to Steve Curran, come to think of it, and I said, what about higher dimensions? Suppose I had like a Z5, this cross Z7, cross a Z8, three dimensions. So, can think of the way to visualize is this put a three by five grid on top and then right down there put another three by five another that other three by five grid so you have eight three by five grids and you just line them up and you wrap around the same way we did before all right and um so anyway it turns out that indeed would prove this always works as long as you have more than two dimensions you can always find a hamiltonian circuit and it's that extra freedom in other words both Three by five, let's make a figure three by five by seven because everything is relatively prime. Well, what happens is in the top row you have 15 vertices, but I will just pick up some of those vertices and I'll drop the next row, some of those, next row, some of those, and then when I get to the bottom, I'll wrap up. 
come back and pick up somewhere I missed. So the fact that I have more than one pass, I can, I can hit the top layer more than once, and that extra freedom allows you to get um, proof that there's always a Hamiltonian circuit. By the way, that simple theorem, that simple theorem says a three-dimensional directed graph, um, then there's always a Hamiltonian circuit. The page was, the proof was 50 pages long. Okay, um, that's the result. Okay, now, what other variations? I remember I'm trying to show you all the variations. Remember when I dropped a point? A point of things like one, one by one rectangle, you know, one dot. It's a one by one, one rectangle. Well, that raises no question. Maybe if I had an IN grid, I could pick an R by S rectangle and drop that corner. So I'm pulling a rectangle out of the brick. Here's a grid, pulling a rectangle out. So here's a Z6 cross a Z, Z4 cross a Z6 with the two by three rectangle deleted. And here's what the graph will look like. And then point is using these arrows, um, can you find a Hamiltonian circuit? And that problem has been completely solved. Well, here's another example. So you have a 10 by 5 and you delete a 5 by uh, 3. And here's, well, this is actually is a Hamiltonian circuit. I mean, it, 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 it shows you the circuit there. Okay. And these two students, they were students of mine. Along with Steve Kern, uh, they, they worked independently, but Sherry Wu was a student in 2006 and Steve Kern was a 2018. And anyway, they saw the form of an N by N grid and pull out any rectangle you want, and they can tell you exactly when it's done. There's not a parameter because you have two parameters for the number, color number, and you have two more parameters, R and S, for the amount and size of the rectangle. So there's a lot of conditions. They're too, too difficult to write down. Here's yet another variation. Well, remember when you deleted a point? Well, since all points are the same, this vertex symmetric, we can always delete the origin. Zero is four and the last. Okay, so then when we delete a point, we're really deleting the trivial subgroup. Aha, here's a new question. Suppose I the big grid and delete the subgroup. Like there's four by Z4 cross Z6, and I'm going to delete this subgroup, this four element subgroup. Um, this, this, the left hand subgroup has uh, zero, zero, and two, zero, and the right hand subgroup has 2.00 0, and 0, 03. And I'm deleting that. And here are the arrows. Following those arrows, visit that uh, 20, 24. There's 20 points there. Can you visit each vertex exactly once and return this point? Probably incomplete. So, we'll come to characterization. Um, okay, that, all right. And by the way, here's an example. Uh, that's the one I had earlier. You do have, well, six by six, and you delete this rectangle. Uh, and I actually, I guess I have a Hamiltonian circuit for that one. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Let's see, what's this one? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, here's another possibility. And then delete it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. See, I always go back to the original. I go, so remember, at one point I said, well, if you couldn't hit every point backwards, maybe, maybe I got to duplicate one point. Okay, well, maybe instead of deleting a subgroup, maybe I can duplicate a subgroup. And indeed, this is so you have a nine by four grid and I have three by two subgroup. I'm going to delete, I'm going to, sorry, not delete, I'm going to duplicate the points of the three by two uh, port of it and get a Hamilton circuit with, with uh, six duplications. That's been solved. <laughs> I'm coming to an end soon. And as you say, well, what about the generator? I'm using the generator one, zero, and zero, one. You move vertically, horizontally, one level. All right. But you generate the other way. For example, it's a generator group. So I can pick other two, two generators. I'm not taking one, zero, and zero, one. That problem's been solved. Like, well, for example, here, here's the, with the, I, this is not the whole grid, but, um, this is a partial grid. In other words, these are the generators. I'm going to generate it. And you have to draw the rest of the way. Um, and then, you know, it turns out that Amy Wilkinson, she's a very famous mathematician now at the University of Chicago, she's won all the major prizes. She's a fellow American mathematician, but she's won lots of prizes. But in any case, she submitted, she was 18 when she wrote this paper. And, um, and she said, well, here's Fan Chung. General theory editor. Uh, we know we usually rely on rely on two referees, but once we became our one of our excellent referees, we decided not to wait. Again, I say this: 
I've never had a referee, uh, an editor, write me and say something like, this paper is so good, we're not even waiting for a second report. Okay, uh, by the way, that, <laughs> that's Amy Wilkinson, and that's Doug Young, right? She, she was about 18, she was about 19, and this is uh, on the campus in Duluth. <laughs> that's what she looks like now, um, much older. She got a PhD at Berkeley. Okay, now, second part of my so I mean, this is Bill Long building up the talk of my title. Of my talk is symmetry patterns, <laughs> making symmetry patterns. And you might say, what's all this talk about Hamilton circuits and grit? The talk is supposed to be about symmetry patterns. Okay, it turns out that, that all the stuff that we talk about is very useful for finding symmetry patterns, hyperbolic geometry. Hyperbolic geometry, not Euclidean geometry. This is hyperbolic geometry. This is infinite plane. And see this back here? Um, this, this bat is this, look at this length. This bat is the same length as that little tiny bat at the corner. The reason why in geometry, you measure distances in a linear way, not the same way that you did it in, in, in Euclidean geometry. And so uh, if I take this coordinate and make the distance this, well, this one to that point, say that one unit. Uh, using the hyperbolic measurement for distance, then if I took this little bat down here, that one to would also be one. And the reason you can see, well, uh, let me explain why this is an infinite plane. Um, see, when you, like, say, well, some of these are the same size. So explain it this way. Suppose you were one meter away from a wall, and I said, take a step forward half the distance, and then take another step forward half the distance, and another step forward half the distance. You would never reach the wall because the distance, even though the distance is shrinking each time, there's always something that's the same thing going on here. When you draw these bats, um, they look very big, but when you draw the next level, they're smaller. When you draw the next level, they're smaller. So they're getting smaller, move for the edge, there'll all be something left. So this is a, and okay, and, and all right. Now, and there's also symmetry all over the place. Like there's a fourfold symmetry, but this corner, fourfold symmetry means this bat can rotate, this bat can rotate to that bat, can rotate to that bat. There's threefold symmetry here. This bat can rotate to here, rotate to there. So this is similar, um, the idea of the, when we move vertically and horizontal, well, that was just a group element. You're using a group element, horizontal move, horizontal move, you're using a group element, uh, zero, zero, and then vertically, you're using one, zero, and one, zero. All right, well, on these hyperbolic geometries, uh, the group elements are these rotations, right? And so here's the idea. I used to be able to animate this, unfortunately, but it doesn't work anymore. If, if I would have given this talk five years ago, I could start with this motif called motif. I could have clicked this button right here and it would go one unit. And see what happens is you start with this motif and then you flip to this line. Now you have a full white angel and a half of a black angel. And the black angel straight would be over there. So then you reflect the other time where the group was out of order too. And you have you, you completed the black angel and you got half a white angel. Anyway, if you kept doing that, let me back up a minute. Um, so think this little edge would have half, half a black angel, half a white angel, but then I do the reflection. Then I get all the black and half the white, and then I keep doing this. All right, again, I can't add it anymore. But the idea is that you if I reflect, 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 reflect. See, this is, um, there's three angels here, four angels. So the moment you take one sixth of the total. So if reflect, 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 you'll be, you'll be completely finished with this inner circle where the inner layer is done. Now you don't reflect anymore because you're just repeating yourself. You'd be going around in that middle. So so again, this is this is analogous to the horizontal moves and verticals. If they grew theoretically, all we were doing is, we were in a certain group and n, n by n grid, and we had some generator, group generator. Here's the generators in three rotation and four rotation. After you finish this middle layer, then you want to do is take this black devil and rotate it 90 degrees, and rotate it 90 degrees, and rotate it 90 degrees. Okay. And then that'll get you here. And then let's see. Yeah, then we rotate 90 degrees and 90 degrees and 90. So now we're making a second layer, second layer. So before we're making the um, reflections, reflections, reflections. Now we're doing rotation, 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 rotation. Somebody has to figure out the algorithms, like doing four by six grid. Somebody has to figure out the algorithm. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, this is another a different way. This is distorted. It's supposed to look like a perfect circle. But I'm 
just showing you the various motifs. Um, so this would be the motifs. That's how you'd start. And you follow group motions that's how you'd end. Um, that's how it's, how it's crowded at the edge there because it goes on infin infinitely. Of course, the commuter has to stop. Uh, there's another threefold, you know, threefold thing in the center, threefold, a threefold rotation here, but there's twofold rotations at this little corner right here, fold rotation. So there's a microphone, threefold rotation. And well, here's another finished product. There's some finished products. Sixfold rotation here. Um, you start with this red mood, um, you could rotate it six times. And then what would you do after that? Uh, well, you'd have the inside circle completely done. Now you rotate this where the tails, that's a full rotation. Then you start a whole new layer. Uh, I'm just showing a bunch of other things that were done on it. All these same ideas came out of the original, came out of the original stuff. This idea of Hamiltonian circuit in a, we were doing, you know, a rectangular grid, but but a guy named Doug Denham, he printed these pressure drawings and he realized that the arguments used for the rectangular case could work in hyperbolic geometry, except you have different group elements. Okay. Um, yeah, some more motifs. Oh, yeah, that's the fifth edition of my book. There's the eighth edition of my book. Uh, this is something I, um, yeah, they don't do it anymore. They have something, each year they had a theme called Math Awareness Month. One year it was math and medicine, one year it was math and the ocean, one year it was math and climate. In any case, I suggested math and art. And they, a, a committee has to, what you make a suggestion, if they approve it, Whoever made the suggestion has to execute it. In other words, I have to make a poster. I have to write a uh, write an article about how math and math and art are set. And then I round up about 20 authors who work on math and art, and they each wrote a paper. So I, I had this website where you could go if you're interested in theme, math, and art. That website where you could download my poster, or else you could find like 20 articles talking about math and art. Okay. Uh, uh, well, 10 or 15 years ago, about 15 years ago, a graduate student showed up at UMD at my school, and it was like the beginning of school, and the graduate, school, the graduate committee asked me to give like an opening lecture just to, as a welcome to kids, to welcome the new graduate students. So I gave a talk, I gave this talk I just gave. Um, now the course of this, and Josh Jacobs was in the audience, and he came up and says, oh, I want to do something just like that. It turns out he was about 10 years older than the book with his student. And for the last 10 years, his bachelor's degree in working in private industry as a computer expert or some, some kind of computer program. He looked at connecting and computers and art. So then um, he, he, he said, can you give me some project like the one that you showed? And, and then I hear something, I said, take a look at this. This was by a number of theorists named Lindstra. I had this idea. And I asked Josh Jacobs to implement the idea. Okay, I'm almost done. All right, so here, here's the idea. You take you take the real plane, coordinate the real plane, to multiply by the energy. So the, the coordinate 1.7 would be the same as as uh, six points, same as 15 points. You're moving up the energy. The energy becomes zero. So anyway, um, so all these all these little red dots are the same set. They're all you know. Uh, in other words, they all have the same length for, from the edge here. They they have the same length across all these things. Okay, so when you can touch the point, you multiply by the integers. Now, two types of transformations he wants. He wants to take this map on the left, and map, he wants parallel lines to become concentric circles. Right, so this is a real transformation. This is all a two point seven one or something. In any case, so you take all these these coordinates over here and map them to this thing. And so parallel line in the plane becomes concentric circles. Oh, by the way, we're also modding out. Uh, we're modding out by the snap button. The, the e x number. Okay, so all right. So then, so the question is, this is how you can make concentric images. Concentric images breaking the we make symmetry patterns with concentric images. So we, this is the real plane modded out by E, but you could also make complex transformations. You complex number two pi, log 250 uh, divided by two pi. In any case, that complex number, there's an IR. And if you make this exponential transformation, 
And these straight lines become spiraling circles, spiraling uh, picture. Okay, so that's how it works. What is it? So here's the thing that's standing. There's the parallel lines, parallel angels and parallel doubles. And there's the there's the real transformation. It's a concentric circle angels and concentric circle doubles. Um, there's the spiraling angels and the spiraling double. So you could, you could, if you had Joseph's program, you could take the image you want, scan it in, and then click a button and you get these spirals. Okay, here's the starting point. We have parallel fish going one way, parallel fish going the other way, and there's the concentric circle fish, and there's the spiraling fish. Here's another example. Well, this is a complex one. Um, okay, John told me. And he showed me all these examples. Then he said to me, certain images work better than that starting point. Certain images begin with work better than others. And he said, the one that works best is a circle. If you have a picture with a circle in the middle, that works the best. And then he showed me an example. There's that costumes. So he began his own picture with his mouth open. And then he did the uh, the, spy, the complex transformation. It's Josh Jacobs and Josh Jacobs and Josh Jacobs. Okay. And I said, I'm a huge Beatles fan. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed my slide early on. I said the long and winding road. That's a famous Beatles song. Every talk I give you about anything is Beatles references. So anyway, I said to him, okay, well, but by the way, my book has a lot of Beatles references. So anyway, um, so here we are. So I said, to him, well, why don't you use the most famous image ever with a circle in it, in the middle? And he says, what's that? And I said, yeah, that's the most famous image. <laughs> okay, so there, there's what he scans in. And here's the transformation he has to make. See, these numbers come from the size. Of, he, has, he has to measure, let's see. Um, the 3.5 comes from the circle. If the circle were bigger, we'd use a bigger number. So he's multiplied by 3.5, but there's the non-zero rails and the non-zero rails. And this is the ratio of the whole image to the circle. And now we do the transformation. But what's the parallel? We haven't transferred yet. That's the model out by 3.5. If you model by 3.5, you get this. We haven't transformed yet. So these are the like parallel lines. All right. Then we transform them to our concentric circles. Sergeant Pepper within Sergeant Pepper within Sergeant Pepper. And, um, and, and so here's, this is the complex transformation. The complex transformation. Again, 3.5 is because it's the ratio. And then there's Sergeant Pepper within Sergeant Pepper with Sergeant Pepper. Okay, this is a different transformation. This is not using, it, it's a different way to transform. He had other ways to transform other than concentric circles and circles and circles. Uh, so that was showing you other, you know, you could pick all, he has a whole habit of menu that you can pick. All right, I have one slide if this works. Um, this is something else. <laughs> Okay, I'm done. <laughs> anyway, I'm done. I can't get the thing to close. Uh, thank you, Professor. That was a wonderful session. Uh, we enjoyed a lot. It was just like reading your textbook. <laughs> Hey, by the way, let me interrupt you for a minute, because when I wrote the book, I uh, had a, Dear participants, if I, you have any questions, please post it in your chat box with your name and designation. By the way, let me follow up on a point you just made. You said it was just like reading the book. I had a great piece of work. When I was just starting to read the book, it was a famous mathematician to visit my campus. I invited him to give a lecture named Richard Hamming. If you heard of the Hamming error correcting codes or the Hamming distance between words, any case. And he, he had written some books and he was actually an editor for a series of books. And he said, What do you do besides teaching? He says, Well, do research and 
working on a book. I started on a book. He says, let me give you some advice. And, and I says, what is it? He says, write the book in the following way. That somebody knows you well, and, and, you, and you wrote this book, and he didn't know that you wrote it. He just had him a book and says, take a look at this book. He didn't know that I wrote it. But when he starts looking at the book, he would say, oh, this looks like Joe Gillian wrote this book. So when, when you said, that's what I try to do. All right. <laughs> what am I supposed to do now? Uh, uh, Professor, mm -hmm. I think we have no questions till now. So we are good to wind up. Professor, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I did. Okay. What uh, question? I think there is no questions till now. Oh, okay, so, fine. Uh, okay. Can we wind up, Professor? Yeah, this is well, done. Enjoy. This is the first time, I, as I said, given an international talk, except for Canada. It was the first time I've ever given a talk after nine o'clock at night. So. Thanks for coming. I enjoyed it. We are very much honored to have you here, sir. And it was so pleasing to hear your talk. Thank you. And we are winding up with some official vote of thanks. Bhavani, can you please take over? I now humbly call upon Ms. Gopika P, Assistant Professor, Department of Mathematics, Christnagar College, for the vote of thanks. Thank you, Bhavani. Respected Principal, Dr. Jolly Jacob, Manager and Director, Reverend Father Dr. Chito Varghi CMI, Honorable Chief Guest, Dr. Joseph A. Gallian, Professor, Department of Mathematics and Statistics, University of Minnesota, Duluth, United States of America. Dr. Mary Matilda Rose, Head of the Department of Mathematics and Statistics, Christnagar College, Trivandrum. Professor R. Shri Gumar, Head of the Department of Mathematics, Sanadhana Dharma College, Alapi. Colleagues, invitees, guests, and participants, a warm good morning to all. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a word of thanks on this International Export Lecture Series Part 2. I, on behalf of the Department of Mathematics, Christnagar College, Ruantra, and the entire fraternity of management here together, extend a very heartfelt gratitude to all dignitaries for sharing with us your time, views, and opinions today. I would like to express our sincere thanks to Dr. Joseph Egalian, Professor, Department of Mathematics and Statistics, University of Minnesota, Duluth, United States of America, for accepting our invitation to be the resource person for the International Expert Lecture Series Part 2. We have been fortunate to have a renowned identity from the academics for delivering the fruitful section on using mathematics to create symmetry pattern. We are truly grateful to you, Professor, for the informative session. I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our sincere thanks to Dr. Jolie Jacob, Principal of Christnagar College, for the wholehearted support and guidance she has extended to all of us in organizing this program. I wish to express my sincere gratitude to Reverend Father Dr. Tito Vargi CMI, the manager and director of Christnagar College, for providing the encouragement and a numerous cooperation in the organization of this international expert lecture series. I thank Dr. Mary Matilda Rose, head of the Department of Mathematics and Statistics, Christnagar College, for her inspiring mentorship, guidance, and care. I would like to express my gratitude to Professor R. Srigumar, Head of the Department of Mathematics, Sanathana Dharma College, Alapi, for his immense support and guidance in the successful organization of this event. I express my gratitude to Mr. Rajesh Kumar R., Assistant Professor, Department of Mathematics, Krishnagar College, for the technical support. I would like to thank all the mathematics members of Christnagar College, Truandra, and Sanadhan Dharma College, Alapi, for their enthusiasm and cooperation in the organization of the International Export Lecture Series. Also, I extend a special gratitude to Mr. Joswin and Mr. Sadish for their wholehearted support. I acknowledge the unwavering support received from the faculty, staff members, and students. 
am also thankful to all the academicians, research scholars, and participants who joined us in this session today. We have been fortunate enough to be backed up by a team of very motivated and dedicated students committee and volunteers. An event of this dimension cannot happen overnight. It requires meticulous planning and execution and an eye for details. I cannot thank everyone enough for the involvement they have shown and the willingness they have expressed to take the, on the completion of tasks beyond their comfort zones. Once again, I want to state that we are all most grateful to everyone on this platform. We thank you for being with on this morning. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gopika P. The feedback link of this session is posted in the chat box as well as in the YouTube description box. Kindly fill the form. E-certificates will be mailed to all the participants in two weeks' time. Well, we have come to the end of the International Expert Lecture Series 2. Hope you have all found this session informative and engaging. Once again, thank you all. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Thank you, Professor. It was a wonderful meeting uh, with you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.